right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom event. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. We couldn't be more excited to be watching everybody starting to join us live on YouTube today. We have an awesome live event from the field in store for you today. So on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see you all joining us. National Geographic believes in the power of exploration and wonder to change the world. The heart of our National Geographic community is our explorers who are cutting edge scientists and researchers, transformative educators and powerful storytellers. Explorer Classrooms live video events connect students with National Geographic explorers for short lessons and extended Q and A's. In a commitment to supporting educators, students and families during this transition, we are now providing Explorer Classroom events every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern. So you can join us later today for another event. And then we're mixing in some really cool events live from the field like the one we're doing today. So today we're so lucky to be connecting with Andy Whitworth. Andy is a wildlife conservationist, National Geographic Explorer and Director of Ecological Restoration and Biodiversity Conservation with the OSA Conservation uh, in Costa Rica. He uses camera traps to capture pictures and videos of secretive species that spend their entire lives high above the ground in the rainforest. So the OSA Peninsula is home to half of all the species in Costa Rica. And this is a staggering two and a half percent of the entire biodiversity on our planet. So think about that for a second. In 0.0000085% of the Earth's total surface is taken up by the Osa Peninsula and 2.5% of the entire planet's biodiversity. That's pretty amazing. So I'm gonna let Andy take over in just a moment. He's gonna give us a lesson, but before we do, I wanna acknowledge that we have several families joining us on screen today, several students, and we're gonna get some questions from them. And I also wanna give a shout out to all the groups from around the world that are starting to tune in. We've got classes joining us from across Canada, across um, the United States, and then a few groups joining us uh, from outside of North America as well. We'll try to do a few of those shout outs uh, during the event. All right, that is more than enough for me. Let's get to Andy. Andy's just hanging around waiting for us. Uh, I'm gonna unmute his microphone. Andy, so good to have you joining us live today. It looks like you're in a pretty cool spot. Hey everybody, yeah, I'm in a fantastic spot. Uh, I'm about 35, maybe 40 meters up in a big old, what we call a virola tree. It's uh, a wild species of nutmeg and it's a fantastic tree. It's perfect for the, the work that we're doing with our boreal camera traps because we're looking for these big, huge horizontal limbs that the wildlife up here in the canopy uses to move around. So things like spider monkeys, sloths, some of the big eagles use these trees as well. So you can see I'm in an emergent tree. So it juts way above the canopy here. You can actually see the Pacific Ocean over there through the trees. And up there goes up towards some, some small mountain tops. So it's quite an incredible tree. Um, and what we're gonna be doing today is actually installing a camera trap um, because we're doing a project on how wildlife uses these arboreal highways. And we wanna learn more about how they use the canopy. What happens if we disturb the rainforest canopy and how we can potentially mitigate any, uh, any disturbances. So, so can we use ropes to reconnect trees that have become isolated? So we're doing some pretty cool things. We're also doing some monitoring with, I'm gonna show you a little piece of kit here. Just bear with me. I'm gonna fumble around. We're also doing some acoustic monitoring. So we're working with another team. I'm just gonna show you this. And this is a little microphone system. Sorry, I'm wobbling around. I'm really sweaty, so the selfie stick's sw swapping around. So I've got this little device, which is a rainforest connection device. So it's got a, an old cell phone in there, and it's got a microphone. So we can listen out to animals in the canopy of the rainforest. So we power it with a, a, um, a solar panel up here, and then we can listen to spider monkeys and toucans, and we can build acoustic AI models that can tell us about the different wildlife that makes sounds in the canopy as well. So I'm just gonna show you here, Ruth, who is on her way up through the canopy. So she's just been making this 35, 40 meter climb from the forest below. I've been up here for a while, but she's uh, looking a little bit tired. <laughs> So you can see it's really tough work. You've got to basically haul 
your whole body weight up up these ropes. Can you see her okay? There she is. Um, so it's heavy work. You've got to bring all your equipment. You've got a heavy big harness on and it's really sweaty. It's about 34 degrees here up in the canopy in the sun. And the humidity is immense. It's about 95% humidity all of the time. And there's lots of mosquitoes and sweat bees and bugs um, basically trying to uh, drink the delicious salty sweat. So here comes Ruth. Hello. <laughs> Ruth's from uh, Peru and we've worked together with camera traps. She's a botanist, so she's a specialist in big trees like the one that we're in here. Um, so it's brilliant when I'm working with the wildlife, she can tell me a lot about the fruits and the foods that they're feeding on um, and about the different types of trees and plants that we're working with. So we're re really excited to be with you guys today. Um, so when Ruth caught her breath, we're going to be in installing a camera trap. But uh, Joe, if, we, if you want to take some questions, we can do some questions whilst Ruth uh, kind of starts, uh, starts catching her breath and then we'll start working with the camera. All right, sounds good. Well, Ruth, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you to invite me. <laughs> All right. It's all I have helped, Joe. <laughs> yes, definitely. So Andy, remind me, how high are you right now? Um, so this tree is probably about 37 meters from the ground, which in feet is probably about uh, close to 120 feet up off the, the ground. So I'll just show you again my kind of legs dangling around there and you can see the the ropes just disappear into the the understory so we've got a full team of people here helping us on the ground as well so ariana and jorge are down on the ground checking our safety system and we can't even see them from up here all right amazing so uh, those who are joining us live via YouTube, can you start sending us some questions in the right side chat bar? And I'm going to visit a few of the groups who are joining us live uh, via camera today. We do have uh, Miss Perry's class joining us today. So I'm going to put it on grid view for a second. If you're in Miss Perry's class, give me a big wave. I can see some of the students have their cameras on there. Some of them. Hey, everyone. Great to have you joining in. All right. We'll pick some questions from your groups uh, as well today. There's Miss Perry. Excellent. All right, so let's get started here. We've got the Anderson family hanging out with us in Vermont. Let me get their microphone turned on. Anderson family, how are you? Uh, we're good. All hey, right. guys. Hi. You guys have a question for Andy hanging out in the tree? Well, yeah. Um, I do have a question. Is there a really dangerous thing that you have done? A really dangerous thing? Hmm. So, I mean, climbing trees, if you're going to climb like 120 feet up into the rainforest canopy can be dangerous, but we try and do it really safe. So we've got all this cool equipment, right? So I'm just going to show you some of my equipment. So this is called an ASAP safety device. So I've got two lines. You can see I've got this white line here and then I've got this red line. So I'm climbing on the red line right now on this piece of equipment here that keeps me safe. And if this one breaks, I'm gonna fall onto my second safety line. So even though this is potentially dangerous, we do it in the safest way possible. So we, we did a lot of training to learn how to climb. Ruth's just moving in to her descender equipment right now. Um, but the scariest thing that's happened to us, I think the most dangerous thing and it's really hard to predict and control for is um, about two years ago, we were attacked by African bees, Africanized bees that have made their way into uh, to the Americas. And so we were in the tree and these African bees came and attacked us. And that was terrifying. There were hundreds of them stinging us all over. And that was really, really scary. All right. Excellent. Let's grab another group here. I can see a few more students just joined us in the live chat. Uh, if you're, looks like everybody can hear, if you're having trouble hearing uh, or with your microphone, you just need to make sure you've picked your computer audio and then you'll be able to, uh, to join in fully. But let's grab a question from the YouTube group right now. So I want to give a few shout outs. We've got Key Largo, uh, Florida joining us. We've got uh, Guelph, Ontario, Isla, Sarah and Zoe joining us, Boston, Massachusetts. We've got Pennsylvania, uh, New York. 
what can let's that? see los angeles louisiana all right so many amazing groups uh tuning in live to hang out with us in the costa rican rainforest today and the first question i have coming in via youtube andy is about exotic birds what are some exotic bird species you've seen up in the canopy oh yeah the, the bird life is just fantastic up here it's amazing so everybody's uh, most people's favorites are the big scarlet macaws and there's a huge population of scarlet macaws down here in Ossa, and it's a real success story. Their populations have rebounded. They've come back with the forest cover that's increasing, um, and they're just stunning. If you want to see a scarlet macaw, this is the place to come and see them. They're like pigeons in the canopy around here. Um, other species are the toucans that have the big, long yellow bills. Um, and then lots of little canopy species, um, a, a group of birds called tanagers which I really love. They've got fantastic colors. Um, and there's some migrant species and um, the summer tanagers down here. It's just fantastic um, for birds in the canopy. Last year, in fact, I saw something incredible from the canopy. So I was up here and I was with a, another National Geographic Explorer called Topher White. And we were working on one of these acoustic devices and it had been raining in the morning. And then what happened was these termites came up out of the canopy, the wing termite species. And there was a flock of birds that came in and we heard their bills snapping and they were picking off and feeding on these emergent wing termites that were flying up out of the canopy. It was just spectacular. There were about 15 different species of birds that we saw feeding on these termites. So it was awesome to have a bird's eye view of the birds. All right, excellent. Well, Andy, Miss Perry just sent me a message and she said, uh, that her students are really interested in biodiversity. Can you tell us a little bit about the biodiversity in the Osa Peninsula and what makes it such just an amazing place? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's one of the reasons, right, that uh, as a tropical uh, biologist and a wildlife ecologist, why I wanted to come to Osa was the incredible biodiversity. So that's all of the life that's here, the different species that we can find. And that's because the Osa has what we call a, a high... Uh, rate of what we call endemism. So it's a place where an endemic is a species that can't be found anywhere else. It's the only place that you can find it. So there's lots of endemic species. So species that are very unique to this South Pacific region. And then we've got this beautiful melting pot of species from South America and species that came from North America on this isthmus, which is Central America that joins uh, where you guys are up in the North with the Amazon rainforest down in the south. So you've got all of this incredible um, diversity. What also makes it really special for me is that it's a place where the rainforest meets the ocean. So you've got this beautiful, big, dense, lush, green rainforest. And I think I said just in the distance there through the trees, that's the Pacific Ocean. Um, and it, it's just stunning. There's a huge gulf that comes in. And so we get migrations of uh, humpback whales that come in. Hammerhead sharks that you see in the Galapagos come over to the Gulf of Dulce to breed. And so we see baby hammerhead sharks there. And it's just awesome. It's the, the ultimate place where the rainforest meets the sea. All right, perfect. So I've had a request to show a map. So I've got a map here on my screen. I'm gonna share my screen for just a moment uh, and give people an idea of where you're hanging out with us today, Andy. So just give me one second. There we go. So you should see my screen now. You can see right here, I have a map of Costa Rica pulled up right there. And the Osa Peninsula, you can see where it gets its name. It kind of juts out from Costa Rica right here. And so this is home. Oops, I lost it there. Let me back up a second for you. There we go. And this is home to an incredible uh, amount of biodiversity. So two and a half percent. It's pretty wild. All right, let's come back from that screen share and let's meet another group who's joining us live. So this time we're gonna to go to the Chef family joining us in Toronto, Ontario, here in Canada. Your microphone's on. How are we doing, guys? Good. Hi. Hey, guys. Hi. All right, who's got a question? Um, I have a question about um, like how high this is. Have you ever fallen off before? Like, have you ever fallen while you're... <laughs> Luckily, I mean, I, I, I consider myself pretty lucky and I think Ruth too, we, we've not fallen um, from a height like this. Um, it has happened where when I've thrown my lines over, so I'm just going to show you guys, 
what we're trying to do when we get the lines over is they should go nicely over one of the branches. Um, but what happens is sometimes it's really difficult to see up into the canopy. So very occasionally your line catches on a smaller branch at the back. And that happened to me once where there was a little branch at the back that my lines had caught on. So when I started climbing, that smaller branch just kind of gave a little snap. I think there's a spy there's some spider monkeys behind me. Um, but the, the, bra the branch kind of gave way and I just dropped a couple of meters. So fortunately, nothing, nothing big. Um, but even just dropping a couple of meters, uh, it's quite terrifying when you're on a, on a rope. Um, so luckily, no big falls. <laughs> All right. I can imagine that would be a little bit of a little frightening dropping a couple meters uh, when you think you got things nice and secure. <laughs> it wakes you up a bit. Absolutely. So Andy, feel free at any time when you're ready to uh, do the camera trap. Uh, otherwise, I can keep doing a few more questions from our groups. No, let, let's, uh, so we'll show you what we're doing with the camera trap. Roos just about ready with things here. So um, we're going to get in nice and tight and have a look at what Roos doing. So you can see uh, the camera here. So this is one of the cameras that we use. I'm just going to focus in on Ruth. And so Ruth's going to open this up and she's very carefully now got to open up, make sure that none of the batteries fall out. I'm just going to show you the camera. So let me look at the front of the camera first, Ruth. So you can see here, this is where we've got the, the motion detector. So as the animals move past, this picks up the movement of the animals. And then these are the lenses that start to film the animals. And then at the top here, this is a special infrared light so that at night time we can see species um, that are active at night and not during the day like um, arboreal porcupines or kinkajous. So that's really cool. And then Ruth's going to open up and she's going to tell us a little bit about what she's checking in the camera here. Uh, so first when we have ready the camera, uh, Andy can help me. So what we look is for horizontal branches, like here. So this is like uh, connecting trees with another tree so the animal can walk along the, along the branch. So ideally, my camera has to look at, at this direction. So what I'm gonna to do now is to set up. We're gonna get nice and tight. Okay. So I'm going to arm the camera. So in our case, we want videos. So we are going to record videos for 10 seconds and a quiet period of 30 seconds. So I'm going to do now the try. OK. OK. So you can see the light flashing on the front of the camera there which means that the camera uh, is going to start in 10 seconds and Ruth's just doing a little test. So she's got to figure <laughs> out. Oh, oh, sorry. There we go. So she's just checking to see now, is the camera taking videos in the exact right point? And then we can check that and then we'll, we'll leave that camera for about, um, for about three months. Usually we can leave them for three or four months without any problems. But what we're going to do in this case, Joe, we're going to look at how many animals are moving around on this branch behind us. And then in a couple of months, what we're going to do is come back and we're going to install some ropes. And we're going to increase the number of ropes coming into this branch and see if that increases the amount of activity of wildlife. So do we get more spider monkeys, more animals moving around when we increase the connectivity of the tree behind us? All right, very cool. Um, Tracy Ford is joining us online and she's wondering, what do you love the most about your job? So this is a question right from Summer must be joining her. Summer would like what to do I, what do you yeah, love? Yeah, what do I love job? most about my job? Well, I think to be honest, this is it. <laughs> it's probably when I'm, uh, when I'm up in the canopy um, and I'm out doing some field work, I, I just love being out in nature. Um, you know, I feel very privileged right now with everything that's going on that I can be in a place like this, um, connected to, you know, touching this giant ancient tree that's, you know, could be well over a hundred years old 
uh, and seeing like there were spider monkeys behind us earlier. I just noticed over there, there's an amazing orchid. I don't know if you guys can see it, to be honest, but there's an orchid, orchid with a stunning red flower and, and just really being out and discovering things. Um, the canopy is a place, especially in tropical rainforests, where uh, there's so many new things to find. There's new species, there's, there's interactions that we don't understand, um, and it's just an incredible place. Um, so that's, that's my favorite thing, being in the field. My second favorite thing is then being able to share that with people, tell other people about it, and bring you guys into the canopy with me. All right. Very cool. I'm going to turn on a microphone and another family of joining us. The Bruce family is joining us in Mississippi. How are we doing, Bruce family? Good. So All right. Go for it, bud. What does a typical day look like for you and Ruth? What does a typical day look like? Well, Ruth's much luckier. She gets to do way more field work than I do these days. Um, I'm a little bit older, so uh, I struggle. <laughs> um but typically, you know, if we were going out on a nice field day, we'd have our breakfast at maybe 6, 6.30. Um, in the field, it's usually pretty basic. So it'll be like uh, here in Costa Rica, they love gallo pinto, which is like rice and beans. Um, usually if we're on a remote expedition, then it's like porridge. So you eat pretty simple things. And then you take your kit out into the forest. I like to go out nice and early because it gets so hot in the rainforest. I like to do as much of my hiking and work early as possible. So we try and go out nice and early. Some days we'll go out for a full day. So we might take a packed lunch or we'll just take some biscuits and oranges. Um, and sometimes if we're going to really remote places far into the forest, then we'll take jungle hammocks and we'll actually sleep in the forest. Ruth has been doing um, some expeditions recently to find some of the rarest trees in the Osa Peninsula. So she's been going on these remote expeditions for a week, sleeping in the forest at a time. Uh, so you have to make your own little campfires, cook your own food. So if you like camping, um, you can do some really cool things with rainforest exploration. But that's that's the best kind of stuff we do. All right. Very cool. So we have Polina Phoenix joining us online, and they're wondering about the most common animal you see in the camera traps. The most common animal. What do you think the most common animal is, Ruth? I'd say spider monkeys. Yeah, I think where we are here in Ossa, spider monkeys are probably one of the most common things. Um, so there's a huge population of uh, uh, what we call Jeffroy spider monkey, which is actually an endangered species. So in most other areas, their populations have, have really been disturbed. They've either been hunted or they've lost habitat. But here in the Ossa Peninsula, their populations are, have exploded and they're doing really well. So we see lots of spider monkeys here. Um, I think that one of the species that's probably more common than we realize um, when we look at the camera traps and we see the footage from the night time are the kinkajous. Kinkajous are really secretive and most people don't see them. But when you see the camera traps, they're actually in a lot of the trees that we uh, camera trap in. Probably like 80% of the trees have kinkajous moving through them. All right. So we've got another question coming in from Miss Perry's group. And they're wondering about threats to the Osa Peninsula, like deforestation, other human threats. What are some threats to the biodiversity in the area? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, um, you know, the threats... Um, I think the threats to wildlife and, and for conservation generally kind of never go away. Um, but what we have seen on the Ossa Peninsula since the early days is a huge change. And actually a lot of those threats have reduced here. So it used to be at one time, there was a lot of agriculture. Uh, the middle of the national park had gold, you know, nearly a thousand gold miners in there. Um, there were cows inside where the national park is now. And all that's changed. So there's almost, there's very few gold miners, but there are still a small number of gold miners. And, th and those are really just people living on the edge of existence and they have very few other alternatives. So th there is gold mining. Um, one destructive activity that happens on occasion is poisoning in the rivers, um, which is really sad. So there are these huge big river shrimp that are delicious. They are really tasty. Um, 
but some um, people to catch the shrimp, rather than catching them with a, a machete, they go out and they put a poison into the river, which is really damaging. It, obviously, it kills everything that's in the river pretty much. So that's pretty um, uh, aggressive down here. And then generally in Costa Rica, one of the things that we're, we're most concerned about, I would say, um, it is the expansion of certain types of monoculture agriculture. So things like pineapple and banana um, are often done at a huge scale, just like palm oil, with lots of chemicals. Um, and it's very difficult for wildlife. Oh, there's some parakeets just fly, flew past us. Um, we heard yeah, that. I, I, those are the biggest threats. Um, but fortunately, things are uh, things have improved in Ossa, and uh, <laughs> you can hear those parakeet, parakeets. Um, but things are improving here, so uh, it, it's looking good for conservation in Ossa, and that's because of all of the incredible work from the government and the communities down here. All right, excellent. Well, that's a really good point, Andy, is that good conservation work, you always have that kind of commitment, not only from the government and the community and, you know, other organizations, when everybody works together, that's when the work, you know, really important work can get done. Absolutely. So Paulette and Jason Shuey are giving you a shout out, Andy, from Toronto. And they're curious, hey guys. And they're curious about uh, how many people live and work at the station at any given time. Oh, wow. You know, I mean, so it, it, it's quite incredible on a, on a typical, uh, we've got like over 40 employees. Um, so in the station on any kind of given day, um, there could be maybe 20 to 30 people working around the station on all of the different projects. And then sometimes we have other groups coming in, other researchers from around the world. We have researchers from Costa Rica. So we've had upwards and over a hundred people in our station uh, a given time. And uh, it, it's just an amazing place. That's what I love as well about working in research stations. You get to meet cool and crazy people from all over the world doing really interesting things. All right, pretty awesome. So uh, we do have several students from, um, where did, there we go, from Miss Perry's class joining us. So Miss Perry's class, we're going to pick a couple questions from your group. So if you use the little raise hand feature, you should be able to see it. I'll see it pop up on my screen and I'll pick a couple of you uh, to ask Andy a question directly. So go ahead and do that. And while I wait for a couple students' hands to come up, Andy, I want to ask you about the data. So you've left a camera trap in the tree for a while. You go up to collect the camera trap. What do you do with all the data that you've collected? How does it help you? What do you do with it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So there's a couple of things that's really cool about the information from camera traps. So firstly, what we'll do is we have to organize all of those video. We have to watch all of those videos. So in some of the projects that we do, we can get over 100,000 videos. And it's a crazy amount of work to go through. Um, so that's what we spend our evenings doing when it goes dark here at 6 p.m. <laughs> We're looking at camera trap videos. So it's really exciting, obviously, when you've got the animals on there. But you do get occasionally a lot of the branches waving around in storms. So that's, that's pretty tough. What we then do with the data is we, we kind of look at the, the distribution of animals in different areas around the forest. So we might ask questions about how good does this forest compare with this forest? Um, and we can look at whether the spider monkey populations are more abundant in one area than another area. So we can ask questions about how wildlife is doing. Um, the other really great thing about camera traps is we get this beautiful footage that we then get to share with people around the world. We get to share with communities and it engages so many, so many people. Um, so I've got some cool videos I think I've shared with you before, Joe, that um, we can share again. Um, and as soon as we get some of this incredible footage from this project later on in the summer, I'll make sure that we share it with you guys as well. Um, but ultimately what we'll do with the data, once we've organized it, analyzed it, we then try and write scientific publications that might educate people um, land managers, people working in conservation about what this information means. So last year we published a paper that actually found that wildlife living in the canopy is more susceptible to human disturbance 
than species living on the ground and especially the big species. So the big things like the spider monkeys that are the real ecosystem engineers because they move the big seeds around. They're the ones that are most at threat. So even with selective logging, you can have huge impacts on these arboreal animals, probably because as Ruth said earlier, you're playing with those incredible highways that they use to move around the forest and you're disturbing them. All right, so Andy, speaking of some of those links that you sent me last time, I just shared them in the YouTube chat. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, about four links. So you should see some links that were just shared in the chat. Uh, and you can check out some of those links and see some of the videos uh, that's been captured by those camera traps. So um, let's turn on some microphones again. So Miss Perry's class, don't be shy. I don't see any hands raised in the chat yet, uh, but we will work in a couple questions of yours. Let's go back to the Anderson family in Vermont. Oh. And see if they have some spot monkeys come in. Oh, okay. Somewhere down there, right? All right, let's hope there's some spider monkeys around. So fingers crossed they might show themselves. We'll see. All right. Well, our fingers are definitely crossed. We're hoping for a little bit of luck. But the Anderson family in Vermont, if you guys have another question, your microphone's on. Um, what was what it what was a big conservational success that you achieved? Oh, that's a great question. All right, what's a big conservation success we've achieved? Well, you know, I think what we do here at Osa Conservation is we, we, um, we have a private reserve with two and a half thousand hectares of land that we take care of and we protect and we make sure that the wildlife has a safe home um, to look after here. Um, what we also do is um, work with other landowners. We work with communities um, to carry out conservation projects. So one of the really cool things that happened just this past year, um, there's an animal. Do you know what a white lip peccary is? Have you heard of a white lip peccary? Well, it's a huge pig and it's got big teeth, like real big tusks. And they go around in huge herds. You can get from maybe 50 of them to even in the hundreds. And they're so important for the rainforest. So I want you to check out the videos of a white lip peccary. And it's the main food source for the jaguar. So big cats like jaguars need white lip peccaries. And it's probably the most threatened terrestrial vertebrate in Central America. So obviously, a lot of people like the taste of pigs. Everybody, a lot of people like bacon. So a lot of people eat white lip peccaries and their populations get decimated. Um, but what we did was, well, we didn't do it. We just worked with a community called Rancho Camado and they're an amazing community. And what they did when the peccaries went on the migration outside of the national park, that's when they really get hunted, they get targeted by hunters. The community monitored the white lip peccaries and tried to stay with them for the full three months of their migration and tried to protect them from hunters. And I just thought that that was incredible to see this community led conservation project to save this very, very threatened species. And I, I, I think that uh, that's the future of conservation outside of protected areas is that the communities become the protectors of these incredible species. So that for me was not my conservation success, but a big conservation success story here in Ossa. All right, very cool and a great question. Uh, Madison has raised her hand in the chat. So I'm gonna unmute Madison here. Oops, I just lost her, let's try that again. There she is. All right, Madison, do you have a question for Andy? What is one of like your like most exotic animals that like you've seen so far? Oh, um, exotic animals. You know, so I'll be honest, like when I was a little kid, I was fascinated with snakes and I'm still fascinated with snakes today. Um, and in one of the climbs up into the canopy, we actually saw a little arboreal pit viper. And so you're never safe from snakes. They're even up here at like 30, 40 meters up in the canopy. So I, I've seen them a couple of times up in the canopy here, sitting up there. And uh, it, it's kind of uh, humbling to see this uh, very poisonous snake whilst you're kind of 
restricted dangling on a rope um but i love them i love snakes and i, I yeah i snakes for me what about you Ruth? what's the most exotic animal you've seen a puma a puma not in the canopy but oh, ruth yeah. ruth was stalked by a puma when she was walking around one night so uh, <laughs> that was probably pretty uh, pretty exotic for ruth wow pretty wild um there's a question that's coming in from a lot of groups online andy Curious mm -hmm. about if the cameras are ever damaged. Do animals like the spider monkeys mess around with them? <laughs> yeah, Roos chuckling away. Uh, fortunately, the spider monkeys are pretty well behaved, but the worst ones are the capuchins. So capuchin monkeys are the most intelligent monkey in the world. Um, and they see the cameras and they make a beeline for them. And they love to kind of have a look in that lens. They, you know, they try and grab the camera. They so Ruth's working away. She's trying to fix the camera. That's what she's doing right now. So she's wedging these sticks in here to kind of stabilize it because the captains come and they try and grab it. They try and bite the sensor. They try and bite the lens. And the other really in inquisitive animal is, is the kinkajou. Kinkajous as well at nighttime always run up to the cameras and they try and play with them as well. But, uh, but yeah, good question. Some species just don't even bother. They don't even acknowledge it, but the captains and the kink Jews really do. All right, I'm gonna turn Emerson's microphone on in a second. But Andy, this question's come in from Miss Perry's class and from the chat as well. I'm glad you mentioned the kink Jew again. Um, people are wondering, what is a kink Jew in North America? We have no idea, at least further <laughs> up in the, in the US, <laughs> and, uh, Canada. Ah, uh, yeah, kink Jew. How do you explain a kink Jew? Well, it's not a monkey. Uh, that I can tell you. It's part of a, a family called the Proconidae. Um, so there's a group of animals called the Lingos, Kinkajous. Um, there's another species as well. I can't remember now. But it's it's kind of looks almost like a monkey. Um, but they've got like canine teeth. So they're quite omnivorous. They'll eat eggs and insects and fruits, all sorts of things. And they're really good in the canopy. They're, they're extremely happy up here. Um, so you'll see them right up to 50, 60 meters. Um, and they're nocturnal. So they only come out at nighttime. Um, but they're, they're really beautiful, um, fluffy, lovely animals. And they've got prehensile tails, which helps them to kind of grab hold of the trees as they move around up here. Um, and they're super inquisitive, really smart looking little animals. Um, and uh, really cute they make a, a cool kind of like yapping sound at night time and up in my house i live on a on the hill which is about an hour and a half's walk up the hill here and i've got a couple of mango trees and uh in a month or two when the mangoes are fruiting i'll get a little family of uh, kinkajous that will come in and they'll be feeding on the uh on the fruits but i think if you check out the videos that joe sent around you'll see some videos of kinkajou in there all right, and I'm going to share my screen really quickly just to give our audience a taste of what kinkajous look like. So they're pretty cool looking. Oh, yeah. And obviously, you can dive in a little bit deeper and check out uh, the kinkajous as well. Very how, cool. How cute are they? <laughs> All right. Emerson, thank you for being so patient. Your microphone is on. Um, what rainforest would you study in? Oh, which rainforest am I studying in now? Uh, well, right now, right now we're in Costa Rica, so we're on the Osa Peninsula. We've also worked in, uh, Ruth and I met when we worked in Peru. So we worked in the Amazon rainforest in Peru, which is really wonderful, really special. Um, a lot more uh, mosquitoes and bugs down there that want to try and bite you and eat you whilst you're working away. Um, but there are some amazing rainforests around the world. I, I I would love to uh, work in uh, an African rainforest with some of the big African megafauna. I visited there once, but I've never had the privilege and pleasure to work there, but that would be on my list. And I think another special place I'd want to go to is Papua New Guinea. I would love to go and visit the forest in Papua. All right, if you ever do that, I'm coming along. So let me know <laughs> Deal. All right, wicked. Bruce family, Mississippi, let me turn your mic on one more time. Um, how did you get into this job? Like, was there someone you looked up to when you were little who had this job that made you want to do this? That's, that's a great question. It, it, I kind of pinch myself sometimes, really, and uh, can't quite figure out how I got here. Um, so I grew up in the northwest of England, and uh, 
to be honest, my opportunities were really to uh, work as a bricklayer or a, <laughs> or a carpenter. Um, so I was pretty lucky that my dad, my dad actually had a pet shop. Um, so I'm going to hold my hands in the air, um, which was a lot of fun growing up with all of these animals. But I kind of realized there was something not quite right about all of these incredible animals being kept in captivity. Um, and so I ended up working in a zoo just because I'd always been around animals. And when I was working in the zoo, zoos talk and do a lot of conservation work around the world. And at that point, I, I kind of realized, I'm like, I want to do that. I want to go out and see where the conservation is done in the field. Um, so that was it. It was just that inspiration to want to go and see it firsthand and see these animals in the wild. And uh, I couldn't be happier. But in terms of inspirational people, um, you know, there's three people that come to mind. Um, Jane Goodall, massive inspiration. What a hero. David Attenborough, who I had the privilege to meet last year, a complete legend. And uh, another one of mine who I always love to watch because he was a bit wacko was uh, Steve Irwin. <laughs> All right. I like your choice of heroes. We're, we're pretty well aligned. Very cool. Uh, one more question from YouTube. This is from Tessa. And Tessa wants to know, what can kids at home do? So obviously, a lot of kids are far away from the rainforest, but can they do something to help out? Yeah, that is a great question, Tessa, an absolutely fantastic one, because it's difficult, right, to kind of think, well, what can I do from so far away? But what I can tell you is that the rainforest and all of the things that happen to the rainforest depend on the everyday choices that we make at home. So deciding, Tessa, where your parents buy their tables from and where that wood comes from you can make sure that that wood comes from sustainable sources of timber. So rather than taking it from an old growth, ancient rainforest like this beautiful tree, that you make sure it comes from a plantation forest, uh, a sustainable source. And that's the same with the foods that we eat. We can think about how we try and source foods that maybe don't contain excessive amounts of palm oil or that we at least try and find some palm oil sources that uh, are somewhat sustainable and that we don't um, take sources that are coming from these ancient forests. So I would just say always ask questions about where your food and where your resources are coming from. And my other uh, advice is that we can reduce our consumption of Forest, I would say is, is another good approach to keep the Amazon rainforest intact as well. So there are lots of things that you can do about your everyday choices and asking questions. And if you really want to go to the extreme, come and live in the rainforest and work in it like I'm doing. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, we're going to hit you with two more questions, Andy, and then we'll let you descend. The first one's going to be from the Shuff family in Toronto. Do you guys have one more question? Um, hey. uh, what? Like um what other places have you worked in like do you only work in rainforests or do you stop or you do you also do like oceans and stuff like that it's a great question so you know i mean my specialty is obviously rainforests so it takes one of the things that you realize about rainforest is the reason why ruth is a fantastic person to work with is she spent many, many years learning all of the different trees and plants in the rainforest, which is a great skill and it takes a long time because there's so many plants and species to learn. So I know a lot more about wildlife, about frogs and birds and monkeys and all of that kind of stuff. So I need some help from someone like Ruth. So we do have a marine program uh, here at Ossa Conservation and we have a couple of fantastic marine biologists that work with me. Um, so I'm not a specialist in marine, um, but I think that's the best thing about this is we can build teams of specialists and different people and we all get to learn little bits from one another. But what I was really lucky last year, I got to go out with National Geographic's pristine seas team and go out and do a big exploration on the ocean. And so there was lots of diving going on, 
putting cameras down into the deep uh, ocean. And it was just incredible. And we were trying to learn more about Costa Rica's amazing marine life. Uh, and that was fantastic. So I'm not a marine biologist, but I got to go along and I went in a submarine, which was awesome. <laughs> All right, very cool. So before the last question, I'm gonna take this one from Miss Perry's class who clearly are studying ecosystems right now. Um, YouTube is wondering about the sound in the background. Andy, what's that bird? That's that bird right now that sounds kind of like a yapping dog. That's the toucan. The toucans are like barking away. That's their call. All right, very cool. And so Miss Perry's wondering about symbiosis. Have you seen any symbiotic relationships? Can you tell us about one or two uh, in oh, the rainforest? Yeah, so you know what? I'm going to put Ruth on the spot and she's going to tell us about the symbiotic relationships between trees and the mycorrhizae in the ground. So mycorrhizae are very important fungi that gave the nutrients for the trees. So sometimes we forget about the fungi, but they are really, really important for this ecosystem. And in the rainforest, they are not really well studied. So now many scientists are trying to study mycorrhizas to help in restoration projects so we can help the trees to grow and help have low rates of mortality. Okay, so yeah, so those fungi are really important for helping the trees to get the food uh, and the resources that they need. So that's one of the most important ones in tropical rainforest. There are also some really uh, uh, awesome symbiotic relationships between, um, again, Ruth knows a lot about this, about um, trees and plants and ants. So you get certain species of ants that live inside little nodules in the trees and so the tree provides a home for the ants and, uh, and, a, and a sap, like a, a sugary food source. And the ants help to keep predators and herbivores away from the tree. So there's a really other uh, great uh, symbiotic example. So there's two good ones there and, and both connected to trees and plants. All right, very cool. So Andy, um, first of all, a huge thank you to you and Ruth for for being up in the tree and hanging around for so long for us. I know it's probably not easy. It's probably starting to get hot. Uh, bugs, who knows? Are you going to descend for us today or do you want to sign off from in the tree today? What's best for you? Um, so uh, I'm going to descend and I'm going to go down. I'm going to leave Ruth here because she's got to finish putting that camera up, but I'm going to descend. So you'll see what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to throw myself off my branch, off my perch <laughs> with all my stuff. And then I'm just gonna get myself sorted. See, so I'm gonna steady myself so you guys can see me as I start going down. All good. Everybody's with me. Looks good. We're with you. All right. Don't so drop us. <laughs> let's hope I don't fall. All right. There we go. So I'm just using my descender now to come down. So there we go. And you should see, I'll start descending into this incredible understory. Ruth disappearing up there. Thank Bye, you. Ruth. Bye. Do a good job with the camera. And so I'm going to start going through some bushes now into the understory. About how high are you now, Andy? Well, now I'm still probably around, I'm about halfway. So I'm probably about 20, 15, 20 meters. I'm just gonna pull out into the, the sun a little bit. And then we should be able to start seeing soon. Finally, we'll see the hidden team on the ground. So you can see how the forest completely changes. Oh, swinging into these branches. <laughs> Uh, so as it's really dense. Uh, we have a question about your background. Did you get a PhD? What did you study? Oh, yeah. So I, I started, I did, uh, my first degree was in zoology. So all about animals 
And then I did uh, a master's degree in conservation biology. So I learned more about specifically conservation. Did uh, my PhD, I followed around. I did, uh, I finished up with a PhD. So here we've got Jorge on the ground. Say hi, Jorge. <laughs> Ariana. And Lucy here on the ground. Oh. <laughs> Landed with a bump. All right, so you can see there's my safety anchor system that keeps me safe when I'm in the tree. Ariana makes sure that I don't die. And if I get stuck up there, they can lower me from the ground, which is really helpful. And Jorge is helping to uh, undress me. <laughs> All right, very cool. Well, I'm going to keep it pinned on your screen for a moment, Andy, and I'm just going to remind the groups tuning in that they can check out Explorer Classroom and many, many more educational resources at natgeoed.org. Uh, we hope to see you at our next event. So coming up today at 2 p.m. Eastern, we have Tracking Bats with Edward uh, Hermy. So definitely check that out today at 2 p.m. Eastern, same spot you're at now. And Andy, I have to say again, you know, this is our second event from Treetops. It's so much fun. I can only imagine what it's like doing it uh, in person. Thank you so much for taking us up there and introducing us to this amazing ecosystem. You're welcome. Stay safe, everybody. All right. The last thing I'm going to do is I am going to turn on all the microphones. So boys and girls, get really loud. Big thank you to Andy and his team. Let's go. Microphones are on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Once again, thank you everybody for tuning in on YouTube. Thank you to everybody who tuned in with us on camera. And you're going to unmute you one more time. Huge thank you. Thank you to your team. That was a ton of fun today. You're welcome, guys. Take care, everybody. All right. Signing off for today.